Thanks for checking out this movie review video. So this is for the 1972 Italian giallo film Knife of Ice. That is this film. I watched it on the Blu-ray and this is in the box set that Severin Films put out for Umberto Lenzi when he worked with Carol Baker as an actress. And all four of the films I thought she did quite a good job in. Uh, this is it. So um, it's a great box set. It's a lot of fun. I do think by far Orgasmo, is, aka Paranoia, is the most fun and interesting of this and I, mean, I was gonna say worth the price but I mean that alone is probably not just worth the price the other three films are good enough to make up the price so just saying but anyway so uh my watching of Knife of Ice finishes that box set um getting into Lindsay films that's my this is my fifth Lindsay film at the moment, and I want to do more. I've heard Spasmo is one I definitely need to see, and Eyeball, I think it, he also did. So yeah. Anyway, like I said, directed by Umberto Lenzi, who also did Seven Bloodstained Orchids, Orgasmo, So Sweet, So Perverse, A Quiet Place to Kill, Spasmo, Eyeball, Eaten Alive, I also want to watch that, Cannibal Faro, Ghost House, and Hitcher in the Dark. Uh, written by Lenzi and also Luigi de Blaine, who also wrote scripts for Kill the Poker Player, The Murder Mansion, which that sounds fun, uh, and Shoot First, Ask Questions Later, amongst other films. Now, the guy who plays Uncle Ralph in this film immediately looked very, uh, very recognizable to me. And I was like, where have I seen this dude before? And then it clicked in my head. I was like, oh, he was in The Case of the Bloody Iris. And he was... Okay, I'm not going to spoil who he is in it, but he was he he had a decent enough role in the case of the Bloody Iris, so I recognize him from that. But I looked up what other films he's been in, and I guess I should recognize him from some other ones because he was also in um, a woman, sorry, uh, a lizard in a woman's skin, All the Colors of the Dark, Death Walks on High Heels, and Eyeball by Umberto Lenzi. So a few, two of those films, Eyeball and Death Walks on High Heels, I haven't seen yet. I do own Death Walks on High Heels. It's over in this stack of movies to get to, and hopefully I get to that soon. Uh, the script comp composition and directing style of this film have been compared to that of Lucio Fulci because of a film that Fulci ended up releasing in the exact same year called Non Si Sevizia Un Paparino. I'm sure I totally butchered that, but that's my best attempt. Uh, this song, or this song, this film, my apologies, this film is also known as Dagger of Ice or The Ice Pick. Um, I think Knife of Ice sounds better than Dagger of Ice and The Ice Pick. Uh, definitely more better than The Ice Pick, but yeah. Um, so, starting this film out with the bullfight certainly is one way to let people know that it takes place in Spain. Yes, that is where a lot of the filming took place, in Spain. So, that makes sense. Uh, it's a very easy way for people to tell because that's the only place that has done bullfighting for the past how many decades? Um, maybe even a century or so. I don't even know. But, anyway, so the start there, obviously that becomes very important later because you get these flashes with the main character of... Crap, what is her name in this? Um, I forget what her name is. Martha. Martha, sorry. You get the flashes with Martha of her, like, remembering back to when the bull was being stabbed and killed. And I think in the end, that's really supposed to be kind of her, the flashes of kind of her suppressing her murderous urges at times. And showing, like, giving that hint that she actually, in the end, is the killer. Which I do think is quite a good twist. And I'll talk about that more later. But uh, I did like that aspect of the twist for it. But the bullfight, um, hard for probably a bunch of people to watch. Including me. I don't really like seeing cruelty to animals in films. Which is why I have not yet watched um, Cannibal Holocaust. Because I know there's a lot in there. Although I do know there's a sanitized version, apparently, that I might be down to watch. Um, the Edgar Allan Poe quote in the beginning about fear being a knife of ice that penetrates um, is a good explanation of the title itself. Uh, that's really cool uh, because, I mean, knife of ice sounds cool enough, but then when you pair it with that Edgar Allan Poe quote, it gives it, like, cool meaning. Like, fear is a knife of ice that penetrates. Like, it's, that's not the exact quote, but it was a, a quote basically saying that. Like, that makes it more cool, and then it makes you think of the title, and you're just like, oh yeah, that's pretty, that's pretty awesome. I like that. 
So Martha is very clearly expecting someone in the beginning at the train station. It seems like she's more just like on edge because she's waiting for someone, I guess. She's expecting someone and they didn't end up showing up on time necessarily. But then you kind of realize that this is a big thing for her and she gets praised for it because I guess her her um, parents had died on a train and she survived because they threw her out the window, which... <laughs> I'm sure she was injured from that, but because of that, she then is traumatized, and that's why she doesn't talk until the very end, obviously, but we'll, we'll talk about that a little bit more later. But uh, the reveal of her being mute is interesting, uh, and it adds kind of an additional feeling of vulnerability for her character, especially when you go into the film knowing it's a giallo and knowing that there will be someone stalking and killing people. Now, the great thing about that is it really sets Martha up as particularly vulnerable, which is why people would not believe that she would be the killer, because she's the most vulnerable there, and you would think that story-wise that's setting it up for she'll be, you know, the main victim uh, that, that the killer is coming after within the film. And you get that feeling, too, after she uh, and her... I think it's Jenny who she picks up, her cousin, after they're, they get in the car with Marcus and they're starting to go, and then Marcus pulls over, and that guy who we learn about much later in the film with the, like, splotchy irises in his eyes pops up and is, like, looking in, and you're just like, oh, creepy dude, that could be the killer, is this who it's going to be? And initially, that's what I thought, like, I thought the whole thing with figuring out who the killer would end up being would be who's got the splotches on their irises. Or I actually also thought that maybe those would end up being contacts that someone would put in when they went into their like murderous rage, which honestly, that's not a bad idea if I do say so myself, but it ended up not being that. So lots of red herrings in this for that reason, especially like people like Dr. L Laurent and Marcus, because both of them end up acting very, very suspicious. Marcus in particular comes off like Slugworth from Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory. Hopefully you you know that reference, because if you haven't seen Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory, where have you been for your entire life? Uh, but yeah, he, he's so like sinister, over-the-top sinister, that like he oozes suspicion, and that's why you would believe it's not him. Also with Dr. Laurent, you know, they work him so hard as a suspect, too, because he's always going somewhere. You know, he's like, oh, well, it's because I'm a doctor. And then you start to think, well, is he using this doctor thing as a way to cover as alibis for when he goes and murders people? Because they also, in the story, line it up with when people end up going missing or dying. Is that he's he has to be somewhere, you know? And then at one point, he comes back and he actually has blood on his pants. And that's that next level of suspicion. So... The script is smart in the sense that it heaps suspicion on those two individuals, but then has a lot of other people who could potentially be suspects as well. And, I mean, honestly, for me, other than the kid, Christina, who ends up getting killed eventually, I I mean, Martha was very far away from, from my mind as being the killer. And one of the main reasons is most of the time when people watch movies, especially back in the 70s when this came out, the narrator, the main character, is almost never the killer. So that's why it was it was a good twist, because it's very unsuspecting. Um, I love the visual when the guy initially shows up with the splotchy visuals of him just looking there. And one of the things that's been talked about with this film a lot is the fact that there's a lot of focus on eyes. And that's one of the other comparisons that, that have been made to Lucio Fulci, because Fulci has a tendency to focus on eyes with his directing. Now, and his cinem cinematography. Now, I think it becomes less as the film goes on, but in the beginning, it is very eye-focused. And once again, I think that's mainly to kind of set up that expectation that you're looking for that person with those splotchy irises in order to solve the case and figure out who the killer is. So it, it's well done in that sense. Um, but I like the visual of that guy. Uh Marcus has a vibe. Oh, I already talked about that. Uh, there's a hopeful feeling introduced when Martha's progress of going to a train station is discussed. Like I was saying, she got praised for that. So it gives you the idea that she'll also end up talking by the end of the film. At least it did for me. And obviously that ends up happening. But in that, but in that moment, when it's giving you hope, you think she's going to end up talking by the end of the film in a good way. Like she made it away from the killer and they were caught. 
but I mean, the killer does get caught, but it's her. So it's in a very different situation where it's actually terrible for her. And the first time she actually uses her voice again, it's a scream. And you think it's because she's afraid because the killer's coming. But actually what it is, is she's been found out. And then she just starts reciting those things that she was listening to on the recording, which I'm assuming that's just because she hadn't used her voice in so long that the only thing she knew to say were, were from that recording, which I believe that recording was from her youth, um, if I'm not mistaken, but you can correct me in the comments. It's kind of a weird scene when Martha honks the horn like it's her scream when she finds Jenny's body under that car. Obviously, we find out much later that that was her who did it. Um, but it, it's a weird scene. It looks so odd when she's just like has her mouth open and, and instead of a scream, it's the honk of the car. It just... It made me kind of laugh. I, did, I didn't think it's a good scene. It's just kind of quirky and weird. But that's Giallo, you know. I like how people are making suspicious comments about each other while talking to the inspector right in front of each other to, like, shift focus. Like, they're all in the same room, and they're talking to the inspector about, you know, who committed this murder. And they're literally being like, well, this person, blah, blah, blah. This person, blah, blah, blah. Not, like pulling him aside like in private it's just like in front of these people's faces like that person's suspicious that person's suspicious it, it's funny of course it's always a sex maniac that is suspected that's the first thing they talk about is it's a sex maniac out there because women are getting killed and obviously that's another device put in the story in order to kind of move your focus away from what's really going on because um then it makes you assume it's a guy and that takes your suspicion even further away from Martha. Like, for that reason, a lot of people probably wouldn't ever consider her just because of the sex maniac thing. And once the satanic symbol is found, Uncle Ralph being into the occult makes sense for him being involved in this actual story within the film. Now, I thought for a little bit maybe Uncle Ralph would end up being the killer because of how into the occult he was and he was very knowledgeable. But really, he's in there probably, one, to be a red herring, but two, to give some information about satanic cults and everything like that. Because if you remember, you know, once that stuff shows up, he gets consulted about it by the by the police. So, yeah. How is the town so foggy in the beginning? Like, it's an insane amount of fog in that town, which it just doesn't look right. It doesn't look natural. It doesn't look right. It's, it's at like a weird time. It's just like during the day, like on no regular streets. I don't know. I don't, I don't assume that's a thing, but I don't know. The necklace C Christina, uh, has looks very similar in construction to the one that had the satanic symbol that was found in the cemetery. Um, and that made me just be like, is there something weird going on with this child? Because those things were so similar but that ended up really not amounting to anything but kind of goes to that bunch of red herrings type thing and then of course they have after that the satanic symbol starts popping up everywhere and kind of like in the film all the colors of the dark there's a very heavy focus on satanic rituals and satanic worship and a satanic cult and yet again within the context of this film that's used to take people's mind further and further away from who the actual suspect is, or the actual killer is. Suspicions cast on Dr. Laurent after he appears with the blood on his pants after Mrs. Britton goes missing. That's, that was probably one of the strongest, like, suspicion moments in the film. Uh, lots of people looking around suspiciously at each other in the church. I thought that was actually pretty funny when they all go to church. I think that was for uh, Mrs. Britton's funeral and they're all just, like, suspiciously looking at each other while the funeral's going on. I thought that was kind of funny. Especially the, with the way it was shot. As soon as they showed the Satanist's face, I knew it's a ruse to distract the audience. When he was shown on the streets, in the rain, breaking into that, I guess it was just like a, like a shop or an apothecary or something like that. Because that's where he steals some morphine needles. And then you realize, oh, you know, it's a drug adult satanist who likes to hang out in the cemetery which is literally who this guy is uh, but there's actually a good quote about who the guy is coming up and why he should be suspicious uh, i have it in here in a few notes but i thought it was a well done scene when there was no music when the lights went out on martha in the house uh, and then you're just kind of like hearing the storm and then also the noise that whatever 
you know, whatever Martha's doing in the house, like the noise from that, I felt like that really helped to increase the tension of that scene and make you feel like anything could happen at any time. Like a killer could jump out of nowhere and be after Martha. Although if you watch it on a second watch, you're like, she's not in any danger at all because she's the killer. So it takes the tension out of it. But it's another one of those moments of the power of not using music and allowing people to just experience whatever they want to feel or experience the tension of quiet or just the ambient sounds of what's going on around. Sure, he looks menacing, but when he's caught in the cemetery, the guy with the splotchy irises just seems like a drug addict. He definitely just seems like that. And like I said, once they showed his face, I knew for sure he wouldn't be the killer because they never show the face of the killer until the end in Giallo films. Uh, here's the quote I was telling you about. All I know is that his name is Rudy Mason, he's English, and he worships the devil. That made me laugh, by the way. And then the response to that, who I think I think it was Dr. Laurent who responded and said this, said, isn't that enough? I thought that was hilarious. They're like, uh, this is his name, he's English, and he worships the devil. They're like, guilty, obviously. I, I mean, people did think that way many times, though. I mean, there was even the, the satanic panic in the 90s in the United States. So it's a thing, man. People just assume guilt in those instances. It's also funny when the maid tells Martha not to let, th let things get her down uh, because her cousin had just been killed and she had, well, at that point, you think she had been strangled, even though later you figure out that Martha staged her being strangled, which... It's, it's interesting because there's a little bit of a plot hole with that aspect of it because wouldn't they look at her neck? Because there would be, like, actual marks. Now, unless she actually, like, pulled it on there and really, like, left a welt, uh, I would think they would be able to look and see that it wasn't, you know, tight enough to believe that someone was actually, like, pulling it to try and kill her. So um, I feel like that's a little bit of a plot hole. Also, when they do find her and the rope's just, like, laying there, I think it just looks funny. Uh, I laughed at that point, at that part. Okay, here's a tie-in that I found to Lucio Fulci, other than like the eye focus thing. I think the Donald Duck toy is a nod to Lucio Fulci because of the role of Donald Duck and Donald Duck toys in Lucio Fulci's films, uh, The New York Ripper and um, Don't Torture a Duckling, which I have seen both of those and I have reviews for them on my channel. And I actually have an entire playlist of Giallo film reviews if you want to check that out. But I really do think there's a lot in this film that's intentionally a nod to Lucio Fulci. I think that's why it gets compared so much. I would be interested to see, and I probably should have looked this up, I would be interested to find out if there's ever been, you know, any sort of interview with Umberto Lenzi asking, you know, did you intentionally put this stuff in to be a nod to Lucio Fulci? I find it hard to believe that with this Donald Duck stuff in there that it's not a nod to Fulci because those things are very important for Don't Torture Duckling and the New York Ripper. So anyone else feel me on that? I like Martha's flashbacks with bits of how uh, she's starting to cast some sort of suspicion on Uncle Ralph. So it makes me wonder like in retrospect, because when I was watching, I was just like, oh, she's starting to piece this together, which obviously in the end, she's not piecing anything together because she was the killer. But do you think it's supposed to be set up that, like, she is the killer, but she's not in control when she kills, necessarily? Like, this kind of, like, split personality type thing. And her having those, like, flashbacks of the the bullfight maybe is a way to show, like, to indicate that she's got kind of, like, this personality split. Or when she goes into, like, the murderous rage, like, the bullfighter killing the bull that, like, that's not her, that's something separate. And then she just, her scream at the end maybe is the moment that she realizes she actually did it. I don't know. It's just a theory, so put it down there. Let me know your thoughts. Or do you have any other theories on that? They do work Dr. Lauren and Marcus pretty hard as suspects, like I said. Always conveniently missing, which lets you know it's not them. I know I talked about Dr. Lauren always having, like, a you know, a, a patient or that he needed to attend to at these times. But the same thing happens with Marcus. It's always, oh, I was around the house working on this, or I left to go get a part for this, or I went to get new light bulbs, or, you know, I was going someplace to run an errand and my car broke down, or there was a branch in the road, you know, that type of thing. So 
Not sure why Martha didn't signal the police officer earlier when she did. She just He just saluted her. That was a weird thing. I, I mean, I guess in the end it doesn't matter that much because she wasn't really... She didn't really have anyone coming after her to kill her at that point. But she, I think, believed that at that point. Because she thought that in the very end when she was in like the catacomb or the mausoleum in the cemetery that like Marcus was after her. And that's why she tried to actually shoot him because he was coming at her and even had his hands out to, you know, fool the audience into thinking that he's the killer. So that was a cool, quick twist in the film. But when she was like signaling at that officer who was outside supposed to be watching the house, she waited so long until she actually signaled. And then he just like saluted, even though he knows he's supposed to be watching the house. It didn't make sense because I feel like he would have gone into the house to check it out at that point. Anyone else feel me on that? Nice twist, like I said, with uh, Martha being the killer. But her motives for killing Jenny, Mrs. Britton, and Christina sucked. She had terrible motives. They were weak. They were so weak sauce. So I like that she was a killer. I just wish there was better reasoning for why she was killing people. Because what, what was it for Jenny? I mean, Jenny, it was that she was, like, jealous that she had a voice. I mean, come on. That's lame. And then she killed Mrs. Britton, I think, because Mrs. Britton was starting to get on to her. And then the same thing with Christina, basically. Because she wrote something in her diary that was incriminating. I mean, I don't know. I didn't like that. Using the narrator as the killer is good because it throws audiences off. The main character is seldom the killer, like I've already said. Bears repeating. Um, so some things to kind of wrap this up. Lindsay and his zooming in the very beginning of the film. And this is how he does it with some of these films. He'll get real heavy on the zooming in and out on things, but it usually doesn't stay throughout the entire film. It's usually heavier in the beginning of the film for probably about the first half hour or so, and then it really settles down or just stops altogether. And this film is one of those instances, so it's very interesting. But like Lindsay does, he does like to keep the camera moving a lot, but I do think that in this film he was more stationary and had less consistent moving of the camera than he does in most of the other films of his I've seen. So I thought that was an interesting takeaway for me personally. Um, so th the last thing I'd say is that the extreme focus on eyes makes me think there's a component of trying to say something of, about kind of like the window to the soul. And especially I think when they're, look, they're showing Martha's eyes and then they're also showing her flashbacks is kind of like the window into her soul and the flashbacks are what's going on inside her body, basically. So, is it a stretch? Maybe. I don't know. You can put your comments down there. But in general, I do want to hear what you have to say about this film, if you've seen it. Do you like it? Do you hate it? Are you in between on it? I'm more of like an in between, but it's one of those things I, I say it all the time. Even, like, the, the the lesser Giallos that I watch are still pretty solid. And this one falls into that category as well. So, out of five stars, with half stars in play, I'm giving it three stars. I was between two and a half and three, but I'm going to go three. I mean, it's enjoyable. I could watch it again for sure. There are some cool things about it. So, had, had a fun time with it. But anyway, uh, like I said, put some comments down there. Not just about this film, but Giallo in general. We can talk about that. Do me a favor, though, real quick, hit that subscribe button if you like this video or any video I've ever done. I would appreciate that. Also, hit the notification bell, because then that way you'll know next time I'm putting up any videos, whether it's a review or unboxing or whatever. But regardless, thanks for taking the time to watch this, and until next time, keep it brutal.